Despite this massive effort to destroy the communist forces, in fact, very little was known about the membership or motivation of the Khmer Rouge. One of the few journalists who managed to meet them was Serge Tion. It was not yet the real uh, Khmer Rouge uh, kind of iron hand. It was still uh, very nationalistic, very purely anti-American. There was no word of uh, communism or, or social reform or whatever. And the population was, was quite uh, enthusiastic. And, and we would be very warmly welcomed in the villages, and it was festive and very nice. And, uh, and we go from one place to the other. So each time we meet, we met uh, the local village chief, and these people were not communist. I mean, they uh, probably had no idea that they were part of a, of a guerrilla that was uh, led by the communists. You know, they, they were uh, looking at the king, at Sihanouk. They felt they were on the good side. They, they felt that they were fighting against the intruders, that these Americans were there, that the Lonnal and, and his military were mercenaries of the Americans. So they, they thought they were doing this kind of civil war just to regain uh, their freedom and to return to the status uh, before the war. Four years and two months ago, when I first came into this office as president, by far the most difficult problem confronting the nation was the seemingly endless war in Vietnam. In January 1973, it was announced that terms for a formal ceasefire in Vietnam had been reached in Paris. Tonight, the day we have all worked and prayed for has finally come. However, what appeared to be good news for Vietnam was certainly bad news for Cambodia. The majority of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces withdrew, leaving the Khmer Rouge in charge of 75% of the country. From now on, the conflict would be Cambodian against Cambodia. To prop up the Lon Nol government, the United States decided yet again to intensify the bombing campaign against the Cambodian communists. concentrated all the air force, air power in Asia over Cambodia. So all the B-52s from Guam and so on. And the American embassy in Phnom Penh, they would take the map and, and draw a square and say, OK, obliterate that square. And since their, their intelligence was not very good, they, they didn't know exactly where the, the, the troops were, they, they bombed the villages away and they killed an enormous amount of civilians. The bombing was considered by friendly military experts as essential to prevent the loss of the provincial cities that were still controlled by the Lunol government. It was really trying to hit a, uh, a fly with a sledgehammer. They would fly out, you know, at 20, 30,000 feet, and um, they would simply um, unload. They had no idea. In some cases, the air crews flying out of Guam didn't even know what they were bombing. ยุบรามพอลือกระพอหอมหมอกเลี้ยงខ្ញុំនៅគូម៉ែអើខ្ញុំគូនាំខ្ញុំរត់ចុះដីដល់ពួកហើយ <coughs> I think 
think it's inevitably associated with uh, bombing. You're always going to hit uh, civilians, particularly if you do it from a great altitude. In August 1973, U.S. warplanes mistakenly bombed Niak Luong to the south of Phnom Penh, killing over 100 civilians. We had a great ceremony in which uh, the United States publicly apologized, and I turned over uh, funds to representatives of the town who uh, came. Of course, you compensating for loss of human life is always uh, uh, unsatisfactory. My condolences, personnel, and the condolences. This six months campaign killed around half a million people. It explains also uh, the uh, kind of radicality of the Khmer Rouge because they were under the bombings and they, uh, they remained there. So the survivors were very tough people because they had been through, uh, through hell, really. In March 1973, Sihanouk had returned to Cambodian soil for the first time since his overthrow. He traveled to the forest near Siem Reap, where the Khmer Rouge had set up their headquarters in the overgrown temples of Angkor. His intention was to firmly establish himself as the leader of the anti-American alliance. The experience was to prove unsettling. He almost got hit by some bombs in, uh, in when he was there in Simria. Uh, uh, so he comes in in 73, embracing uh, Paul Pot and some of his people in the forest. Uh, and says, I'm, I'm your leader, and they kind of hypocritically go along with it for the movie's sake. But it's all very nerve-wracking. I think uh, he, was, he was pretty frightened most of this trip. He could have just uh, had an accident during this trip. But he gets back to Beijing, and then he knows pretty much the jig is up on, on, on taking charge this moment. He's, he's seen. The, the real leaders, and he knows these are very strong, very ominous people. By using Sihanouk's name to attract recruits, the Khmer Rouge forces had swollen from under 3,000 to over 150,000. The American bombing campaign was also increasing their numbers. It was a great uh, recruiting thing for the Cambodian communists. People either got so upset about the bombing that they would join the Khmer Rouge to try and have some hope of fighting back, or they deserted the countryside to go to the cities where they felt that they would be a bit safer. So there was a huge refugee uh, flow from the countryside to the cities that made it even harder for the Lon Nol regime to uh, manage the people they had under their control. So Phnom Penh, the capital, for example, went from five or 600,000 population to two and a half million. Phnom Penh was full of lots of refugees. The city's infrastructure was completely overwhelmed. Um, there were poor, angry people everywhere. To make matters worse, the Khmer Rouge were nearing the outskirts of the city. This brought the American bombing ever closer to populated areas. It became the so-called carpet bombing of Cambodia. Um, which l led to widespread devastation. The, the nation of Cambodia, as, as was known before, was becoming non-existent. In the six months since the ceasefire in the Vietnam War, the Americans dropped more than a quarter of a million tons of bombs on Cambodia, three and a half times the amount dropped on Japan during the Second World War. In his last press conference, Ambassador Swank expressed his disillusionment with the American presence in Cambodia. 
I said, the war has lost meaning. Uh, and I meant any meaning for the United States, uh, which, of course, at that time was at peace, supposedly. In the United States, Congress and the public had had enough. The President of the United States is not a dictator. At least he's not supposed to be. He's supposed to respond to the expressed will of the Congress in law as passed. Congress wanted this war to stop, and the first step was to overrule the President and order that the bombing cease. On the 15th of August, 1973, the last American bombs to fall in Southeast Asia exploded around the perimeter of Phnom Penh. The end of the bombing campaign was followed by the winding down of American military aid. Any hope of victory for Lon Nol's forces was also being undermined by widespread corruption. They also had to survive the lousy leadership of their political leaders and their military leaders, uh, the cowards who would uh, stack the, uh, the, the wages bill with a whole lot of ghost soldiers who didn't exist. They would draw pay for them, pocket the pay, and then when the fight came, they were under strength. They might be thousands under strength. Uh, of course, they would lose. And the ones who were unfortunate enough to be at the battlefront were the heavy losers. Soldiers were very unhappy, they weren't being paid, uh, they were being sent out to die for what they perceived quite rightly as a corrupt authoritarian regime, uh, and were, were reluctant to die for that. Uh, the place was coming apart at the seams. General Dien Del was one of Lon Nol's few really effective commanders. The situation was really bad, and I think we have to change the leadership. Because, uh, as I told you already, that uh, Marshal Lonel cannot uh, direct the country, lead the country. By early 1974, General Dien Del and other senior military figures were about to stage a coup d'etat. David Whipple was CIA head of station at the time. There was a coup organized by Khmer, our friends, officers, they were going to overthrow the government of, um, of this in, in Phnom Penh. And I had extremely good intelligence on this. Inexplicably, the Americans would not permit a change in the Cambodian leadership, even at this disastrous stage of the Civil War. Some foreign friends don't like I to do that, because uh, not in their interest. Using my local uh, base chief, I s stopped the coup. And the way I stopped the coup was simply to warn the coup plotters that if they did that, that would land them, uh, that would end up very detrimental, not only to them, but to their country and to their whole cause. And persuaded them that they would not get any support from the Americans if they did that. From early 1974, Richard Nixon, architect of the Cambodian tragedy that began with the secret bombing of 1969, was engulfed in the Watergate scandal. Amongst accusations of widespread abuse of presidential power, Nixon resigned on the 8th of August. By early 1975, the Khmer Rouge were poised to deliver the final blow to the beleaguered Lon Nol government. On the 1st of April, Lon Nol departed for exile in Hawaii, never to return. Less than two weeks later, American helicopters arrived unannounced in Phnom Penh. The last remaining Americans and some select Cambodians were being evacuated from the besieged city. David Whipple was on the last helicopter to depart. The Khmer didn't know we were going to do this and we were embarrassed to do it. And as I took off, I got in this chopper, and there were some military officers in there, American, who had been military attaches and that sort of thing. And I remember one or two sat on either side of me in the thing, and both of them wept because we were letting down the, uh, the people who had depended on it. 
depending on us. And you look out the window of the chopper, and you see all these people looking at us perfectly normally. ແລະກອງຕອບອາເມລິກັນນັ້ນຊ່ວຍພົດຈົ່ງພົດດາວເດີ້ <laughs> Less than one week after the surprise American departure, the Khmer Rouge overran Phnom Penh's defences. ហើយតែហ៊ានលុនដល់ម៉ាម៉ានឹងលោកដោះខកអើតែហ៊ានចេញលោកពាក់ខកអើស៊ីវិលដើម្បីទទួលពួកណាជនគុំនេះដែលច
It was now the 1980s. In the last phase of the Cold War, America's priority was to support the Chinese, who in turn were allies of the Khmer Rouge. For the next 10 years, Cambodians suffered, as US and Chinese pressure in the United Nations ensured that sanctions prevented aid from reaching those in desperate need. The collapse of the Soviet Union in the late 80s signaled the end of the Cold War and the end of Soviet support for the Vietnamese presence in Cambodia. The Vietnamese withdrew and the United States now abandoned the Khmer Rouge. The group that had once terrorized a nation soon shrank back to insignificance. In 1993, at a staggering cost of three billion US dollars, the United Nations supervised democratic elections in the devastated country and in a final twist, the master game player, Norodom Sihanouk, returned to the role he had assumed over 50 years earlier and was re-crowned King of Cambodia. Today, in the Cambodian countryside, farmers use B-52 bomb craters as reservoirs for their crops. These are the visible scars of one country that was all but destroyed by the strategies of what remains an ongoing global power game.